Commissioner, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to State of the Net for having us as well. I'm glad we've gotten the, the doggy bag etiquette out of the I, way so I can... As I was yelling over there, you're welcome. Everyone <laughs> do away with those yes, questions. Absolutely. Um, great. So I, I wanted to start off this conversation with talking about one of the big topics, of course, at, at this year's event in, in, uh, in DC tech policy circles, um, which is AI. I was just wondering if you could speak to what you see as the most pressing issue um, posed by the technology that the agency uh, needs to grapple with. Sure. I think right now, and first of all, let me say thank you to you, Cristiano, for uh, volunteering to do this. Mike, for Amy. Mike. Mike, Mike. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Let's do this. Um, so uh, uh, we've got two, I was saying thank you to Cristiano, thank you to Amy, thank you to Tim, uh, and, uh, and all of you for being here. I think there's two things that are front of mind right now. Obviously, we need to stay on top of generative AI, large language models, uh, these very sophisticated systems that are very quickly coming into, uh, into regular consumer use and business use as well. And so on that front, we have uh, recently subpoenaed uh, some of those prominent uh, companies in the space to figure out some of the com competitive dynamics at play, some of the relationships between the companies that may or may not be apparent from the outside. Um, we have convened artists, we've convened creators, we've convened writers to make sure that we don't get lost in this dazzle of the technology, uh, uh, the fact that there are real people's livings, their work, their art at play and making sure that um, that they, uh, uh, they get a fair shake. Lastly, we have, through our Alexa settlement, I think made clear that we need to train our machine learning model is not a justification to break privacy law. And so, of course, we are trying to stay ahead of the curve on this. I think we're succeeding, uh, thanks to Chair Khan, thanks to Commissioner Slaughter and, and the staff working on all this. At the same time, I feel very strongly that, and I know my colleagues do as well, we cannot lose sight of the fact that while these very advanced generative systems are rolling out, simpler but no less consequential systems are pervading decision making in our lives. We're used to uh, AI uh, being used to you know, prioritize messages in our inbox, help, help us avoid traffic, things like that. But in 2024, increasingly absolutely critical decisions about our lives, uh, our health care, who is hired, who is fired, how much we pay for rent, that kind of thing is set by algorithm. And we are keen to make sure that those decisions are made fairly. And so for me, one case that has gotten too little attention is our settlement in the Rite Aid matter. Uh, so those are the two fronts I would say are front of mind when you say AI, what are you doing, FTC? Um, so on the, the Rite Aid settlement, um, in your statement on that, you talked about how the settlement was, quote, a strong baseline for what an algorithmic fairness program should look like. How, how might the agency look to apply this baseline to try to rein in use of algorithms more broadly? So in let's take a step back and, and uh, talk about what Rite Aid was and did, and then I want to get to that uh, um, that question. So. In Rite Aid, we allege, and everything I'm going to say, are, these are allegations uh, that were uh, part of a settlement. We allege that the company, the pharmacy, the retailer, rolled out a face surveillance system over eight years that disproportionately flagged women, disproportionately flagged uh, people of color, and uh, uh, for uh, falsely accusing them of being persons of interest who'd engage in shoplifting or other illegal uh, um, illegal uh, activities. And some of the cases that came up were, uh, were shocking. We, there were instances where an 11-year-old girl walks into a store and is falsely accused of shoplifting, is stopped and searched. Uh, her mother later says, you know, I had to miss work because my 11-year-old daughter was so distraught at this. You had a woman who was stopped, searched. Uh, I think the police were called uh, uh, to come and get her. Uh, who was flagged in response to a, an image that was later described. The, the, the woman in question was African American. The image uh, was later described uh, as depicting a, uh, uh, as a white blonde lady, right? Um, you had instances where people were out with their coworkers, with their families, and were audibly, publicly accused of, of breaking the law falsely. And these are people who'd done nothing wrong. And so why am I you know, giving you this litany of harms? Because we need to remember that these systems can hurt people. And the legal term is substantial injury. 
uh, under our unfairness analysis. And so um, when you say, how might this be used in the future, one reason I want to underline the settlement like 16 times is because if you are a company using an algorithmic decision-making system in a way that may substantially injure people, in a way that they cannot reasonably avoid, and in a way where the benefits aren't outweighed by those harms, then you should expect to familiarize yourself with the Rite Aid settlement, because we'll be very interested in applying it uh, if this comes to the attention of our staff. Um, and so I see it as a, as a way to comprehensively assess bias, root out bias, ensure that the right people are running these systems, um, ensure that people know about the systems, ensure that they're told when they're used on them and they have an opportunity to contest them. So I see it as a framework for, uh, for addressing uh, algorithmic unfairness. And uh, I hope we don't have to use it again, but, um, but I suspect we might. Um, on the front of AI and competition, you touched on the inquiry that the FTC recently launched into some of the investments that major tech companies um, are making into the space, including uh, companies such as OpenAI and Anthropic. Um, and Politico recently reported that the DOJ and FTC have had discussions about which agency should lead a potential competition investigation um, into some of those partnerships. W what's your personal level of concern at the moment about whether those types of investments um, pose a threat to competition? And do you see this as an issue that's in the FTC's lane? We'll see, but we're interested. We're very obviously interested. Um, one, and, and this is why you know, we're conducting a 6B study, which is a, a study where you can really peer under the hood of these companies. You send them compulsory process, which is a fancy word for a subpoena, to understand uh, exactly what the relationships are, what the competitive dynamics are. Um, uh, I really benefited from reading a report from one of our, um, one of our, uh, I guess you could call sister agencies in the UK. The, the uh, Competition and Markets Authority did a terrific report on these large systems and helpfully pointed out that it's not as if um, there are limitless resources here. There are already uh, bottlenecks in the in the words of the CMA, right? Uh, or I don't know if they use, technically use the word bottleneck, but they said, you know, you have. Uh, the need for a skilled uh, a, a pers a personnel staff with certain requirements, and that's a limiting factor. You also need to have massive compute, right? That's a limiting factor. You also need to have act the platforms in which users or other businesses will engage with you. And so at each of these joints, junctures, et cetera, whatever you want to call them, that could limit uh, uh, the ability of companies to have a level playing field. And so that was very helpful for mapping out what may be some of the competitive bottlenecks. And my hope is that the, um, the, the study that we're conducting will shed light on that. And obviously, some of the information that comes out uh, or that we receive will be information that's already out in public, but some of it will not be. And I think we'll benefit from that. Um, could you talk a little more about what types of questions you're hoping that that study, that inquiry provides that might help sort of um, shape the agency's direction on this going forward? So I, I, I don't want to mischaracterize, I mean, they're all right there. I mean, I th I'm pretty sure that, we, that, that, that the questions from the 6B are public. Um, so I would, I would suggest folks look at that. But for me, the most interesting thing is, is the relationships between who, ha who controls those potential bottlenecks and how that may, uh, uh, and how that'll affect the playing field for new entrants who don't have those legs up already. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, you yourself and the agency, of course, have been very involved in discussions at the federal level about children's online safety. Yep. Um, a big piece of that is the FTC plan to bar Meta from monetizing um, children's data. I've, I've spoken to a number of, of advocates in the children's safety space that have argued that this should be um, uh, a roadmap for how the agency, from a policy perspective, tackles this issue across the tech sector. Do you agree, and, and how do you think that could be applied so more I, broadly? So I cannot talk about that litigation, but in other public settings, I have endorsed legislation that calls for a ban on targeted ads for children. So as a policy matter, I, I think that it is a very compelling proposal to um, reduce the desire to keep children online in perpetuity. And uh, targeted advertising is a key part of that. And so as a policy matter, I absolutely think it's a, it's a, it's a logical step as a whether, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at the policy side of it and not touch on the litigation. Okay, um, uh, another uh, sort of key uh, decision from the agency recently was the settlement um, around Fortnite and Epic yes. Games. 
um, and which were over allegations that the company used deceptive design features right. to right. Uh, trick players into making unwanted purchases. Wondering if you could talk about Absolutely. how you see the standard there potentially being applied more broadly. Yeah. So. One really important thing to appreciate about Fortnite is that it goes at one of the key contributors of what are alleged to be teen mental health harms online. If you, you know, and, and Danielle Estrada, my colleague, and I did this, you know, go online and just download all of the social science research on, these, uh, uh, on this question of what is driving alleged teen mental health harms online, you're generally going to find three buckets. Um, one is the one that probably most people spend time talking about, which is uh, content, right? Uh, and I'm not making a claim either way on that, but uh, uh, but the allegation is in research and elsewhere that that teens are exposed to content online that um, let's say extreme dieting content, let's say pro anorexia con uh, content, pro bulimia content, etc., and that that is harmful. So that's one bucket of harms. The second bucket of harms goes to extended engagement. It goes to children and teens spending much more time online than they want to or normally would, but for the absence of certain techniques and technologies and design features that keep people online. So um, the most commonly trotted out ones are endless scroll, uh, autoplay, et cetera, but there's any number of features that continually drive people to return to the platform when they wouldn't normally think to do so. The third bucket that Fortnite gets at is another generator of teen mental health harms online is, is uh, abuse and harassment. Uh, and one thing that was happening, that we allege was happening in the case of Fortnite, is that the company set privacy settings so low that children and teens uh, uh, were being verbally, audibly harassed uh, uh, while they were playing Fortnite. So much so that I think one of the most uh, um, jaw-dropping parts of that complaint was that you would have Fortnite engineers visit you know, their little cousin's house and ask, hey, wh why, is the, why is the volume off on the television? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, uh, th these weird guys are harassing us, so we just turn it off because uh, we can't figure out how to turn off the, the audio. And, and the engineer went back to, to their team and said, you know, how wild is it? And, and I'm, 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 I'm speaking loosely here. This is obviously not exactly what's in the complaint. The complaint will tell you what's in the complaint. Um, saying, how can it possibly be that we've built something that's so hard to manage in terms of privacy settings uh, that, you know, Perfectly savvy kids and teens can't figure it out or instead of turning off the volume of the television. And so we required the company, uh, uh, and this was the staff's idea, and I think it was a terrific one, to set the privacy settings for kids and teens to their highest level. Um, and that is something, I think it's come up in some other cases, but um, making sure that, that kids and teens uh, 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 have to make the deliberate decision to connect with other people, and they can choose who they connect to, right? Uh, but that it isn't imposed on them, I think, is a very important step forward that will help address this third bucket of harms around abuse and harassment. Um, another major effort that's related, of course, around children's privacy is uh, the FTC proposal on the COPPA rule and to yes. try to strengthen some of those um, requirements. This was a process that was uh, initiated in 2019. The agency yes. began soliciting comments just this past year. They yes. Um, put this plan, plan forward. I'm wondering if you could speak to the pace at which the agency has been able to move on some of these issues, and if you're if you're concerned that it's it's not able to keep up with um, some of these uh, concerns as they're springing up. Let me say two things that are both true at the same time. Uh, if you compare the FTC staff in charge of privacy to the population of the United States. That's a ratio, right? Compare that ratio to those of our peer countries. We are, compared to our peer G7, G8 countries, uh, a small fraction of what they are in terms of the amount of money that the federal, their governments spend on privacy at the national level. With that said, our DPIP staff is truly top flight. And I knew it from the outside when I was a Senate staffer working with the FTC, calling them as witnesses. But now on the inside, I mean, look, one thing I would, I would point out is that that same month that, that FTC that we proposed the, uh, the COPPA the rule update, we also settled this major, the first ever algorithmic fairness settlement with Rite Aid. Um, and in the same matter of weeks, we settled a matter with a, uh, an advertiser that was literally creating categories of people by the doctors they visit, right? 
and just selling that to the highest bidder and settle that case. Um, and all this is just the public stuff, right? Behind the scenes, you have other processes, other cases, other matters. And so with the resources we are given pound for pound, uh, DPIP and every other part of the FTC is, is knocking it out of the park. But um, I think it's a shame that, that, uh, uh, the, that our commission uh, uh, is not funded to the same level as, well, I'll just, I'll just say, I'll reiterate what I said earlier, uh, um, that we receive a fraction of the funding in relation to our peer nations when it comes to privacy. And um, I think, yeah, you know, uh, uh, things may look different if, if, if that were not true. Um, we have just a few more minutes, Please. but I'm going to try to sneak in a couple more questions here. Um, there, this debate around children's online safety, of course, is happening at, at the federal level. It's happening on Capitol Hill. It's happening at the state level. Uh, there's, there's a major proposal in the Senate, the Kids Online Safety Act, that yeah. seeks to expand some of these requirements. But it has faced some pushback over concerns from advocates that it could um, hinder privacy uh, and also chill speech online. Um, you're, of course, a longtime privacy advocate, so I wanted to get your thoughts on the approach of that legislation and whether it strikes the right balance on these issues. So let me answer quickly a few things. First, this is hotly debated. I have not read the most recent drafts. I've publicly said, you know, two lodestars for me are, yes, I do think there need to be new tools uh, that help uh, uh, folks in law enforcement at FTC and elsewhere protect teen mental health online. At the same time, uh, the, the internet is a lifeline for LGBT people, and we cannot cut that lifeline. So those are my two lodestars, but I won't, I won't speak to the current debate because I have not been following these latest iterations closely. As for what we're doing, we're doing every single thing we can using every resource at our disposal. We are an active part of the President's Task Force on Teen Mental Health Online, number one. Number two, um, we recently discussed the, the COPPA rule proposal. One of the things that's part of that rule proposal is making sure that the special permissions that are allowed for contact information aren't misused to keep nudging children and teens to come back to the platform over and over and over again. That's a proposal, and folks are encouraged. I encourage people to comment on that. And then lastly, we're bringing enforcement actions like Fortnite. So we're doing everything we can to address this problem. And sorry, I should mention, we're also working to bring on psychologists, uh, uh, pediatricians, et cetera, uh, on staff uh, this fall so that we um, follow uh, agencies like the CMA uh, and some of our peer agencies that have these interdisciplinary teams. And so we're building capacity, we're using law enforcement, using rulemaking, using every tool at our disposal. Uh, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, a number of states are taking a different approach, uh, including Florida and Utah, of either banning teens up to a certain age from accessing social media altogether or requiring parental consent. Do you think that's the right approach? Absolutely not. I think it's, it's I mean, meet a teenager, they will find a way to get around that, uh, uh, number one. Number two, I, I, I'm not a First Amendment expert, but I have a hard time seeing how that would survive First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, so no, that I can say clearly I do not support that. Um, and, and last question before we wrap up here. Um, you are involved with the, the task force that President Biden yes. um, created dealing with this issue and along with other agencies. Uh, and you guys are working on uh, developing uh, best practices for uh, industry yes. to try to tackle this issue. Wondering what you see as some of the key areas that that could potentially address. Let me just suggest one frame that I think um, I want to encourage anyone working on best practices to think of when it comes to teen mental health online. So um, I'm sure everyone or a lot of people in the room are familiar with the Surgeon General's Mental Health Advisory on Teen Mental Health. And people are also familiar with the National Academy's report on uh, teen mental health online, which came to a slightly different conclusion. And I just want to point out a subtle but critical difference between these two documents. Because if you read Surgeon General Murthy's advisory, he is asking one question. And if you read the National Academy's report, it is answering a different question. The National Academy's report is asking, is there enough evidence that social media is harmful, right? The burden is to prove the danger, right? Uh, uh, whereas Surgeon General Murthy is answering a different question. He's saying, is there enough evidence to prove that social media use is safe, right? So the burden is on the company to prove safety, the research to prove safety. And so I think that us as a law enforcement agency, we have to answer this question, right? We have to establish causation. We can't bring a case against someone unless we can prove that, that, uh, that the technology, technique, et cetera, caused a harm. Of course, absolutely. But when we're dealing with best practices, I think the more relevant question is, is it safe? Can you prove it is safe? And for me, what the Surgeon General said is, 
is the uh, uh, most informed word, I would say, on the subject. And the conclusion he makes is, while there are benefits, uh, there also is, is not enough evidence to establish safety. And uh, we do need to take precautions. So, um, so that's what I would say, is that we need to ask, is there evidence to establish safety when it comes to the best practices? Great. We've covered a lot of ground. Commissioner, thank you, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.